And so sometimes when, um, when I offer these things to the Mormon, uh, the response will come back and they'll say, okay, well, I had this real experience. You tell me what that is. You know, what, what, what else could have caused this experience except God? Well, again, an appeal to the Scripture helps, I think, it maybe gives us an indication of, of what, what other possible explanations there are, because I think there's certainly a, a, another, an alternate explanation for the Mormon experience on this one. And we look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 14. It says, Paul writes, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And so we've got, um, we've got another being in this universe who disguises himself as an angel of light. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that he, he, he prowls about like a roaring lion looking for people to devour. And uh, now this one you've got to kind of tread uh, around a little more gently, but a possible explanation is that, you know, Satan is a deceiver, and, and he's pretty good at what he does, and he can appear as an angel of light. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can take, uh, take your Mormon friend or family member to Galatians 1.8, and look what Paul says. Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And so the real question is, is the gospel of Mormonism a contrary gospel to that of Christianity? If so, they both can't be true. Maybe they're both false, but they both can't be true. And, um, uh, and even if the gospel is preached by an angel, right? You go go uh, go back into Mormon history, and you've got the angel Moroni who reveals the uh, gold plates to Mor- uh, to uh, Joseph Smith. Um, we have now an, uh, maybe an alternate explanation. If 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 Mormonism doesn't match up with God's word, if there's problems with uh, and, and really when it comes to you know we're talking about the epistemology of Mormonism and. In epistemological justification theory, one of the things that's that's looked at are what we call anomalies. And so every theory has its anomalies, and if you've got enough anomalies or problems, if you've got enough problems and those problems mount, they have the, the, uh, the ability to overthrow a theory. You know, and we actually spent some time in the Museum of Church History in Salt Lake City, and, and just in the first five minutes of that tour you see anomaly after anomaly after anomaly, problem after problem after problem. And so we've got Joseph Smith's first vision, and there's this nice stained glass uh, rendering of it. But even with Joseph Smith's first vision, you've got eight different accounts. Then you've got the picture of him pulling out the golden plates, and we heard an interesting uh, presentation by Bill McKeever, who's a Mormon apologist, or apologist, uh, a Christian apologist on Mormonism, talking about the weight of the gold plates and Really, the implausibility of the story of Joseph Smith running through the forest, jumping over logs, fighting off attackers as he's carrying these plates that uh, are estimated to be over 200 pounds if they're pure gold. You've got the Book of Mormon and the the lack of archaeology. I mean, you've got problem after problem after problem that arises for Mormons. And and, and I guess, you know, the strategy seems to be let's... We, we don't have good answers for these things. I mean, there's just way too many of them, and so it really spells trouble for our theory here, for our views on Mormonism or on, on the Gospel or on the Book of Mormon. And so, therefore, the appeal is to an experience that you, you, and you pray about it. And that really is kind of the only defense that you're able to fall back on if you're, uh, you're going to be intellectually honest. And, um, and so that's Mormon epistemology. I think we have a great response to it. But I would want to say this in closing. Sometimes we as Christians are guilty of the same kind of epistemology, right? Where you've got Christians who make an appeal to experience as their sole source of justification for the Christian worldview. Well, you know, and it, maybe it's a testimony, or I've experienced God, or I felt God. God has changed my life. And of course, uh, a, a, a testimony or a witness is a good thing. It can be a very powerful thing, but it's certainly not the only thing that we have to justify our beliefs as Christians.